All right, Christianity for Beginners, this is lesson number four. The topic of this lesson, Jesus Christ. You can't get more basic than that. Christianity for Beginners, we're going to talk about Jesus tonight. So far in our series entitled Christianity for Beginners, we've covered the following topics. Basic belief in God, the Christian religion itself, and the Bible. And basically we, we've tried to answer the question, why do Christians believe in God? Why do they believe that there is a God? And we've given answers to that question. Uh, the Christian religion, we compared the Christian religion to other major religions in the world to see its, to demonstrate its strengths and its advantages in comparison to other world religions. And then last time we talked about the Bible. Why do Christians believe that the Bible is inspired of God? We gave some reasons for that. Today's lesson will examine the reason for faith um, and the Bible, and that is Jesus Christ Himself. Now there are a lot of theories about Jesus. <clears throat> some say He's an ancient Jewish rabbi, a prophet of some kind, a ghost, spirit. Some have even said that He is some kind of alien being from another planet, some kind of advanced life form. I've actually read an article about somebody you know, proposing that idea. And I'm sure that the speculation is going to continue and more opinions and theories will eventually be developed. There's always some new angle that someone is going to come up with that who is Jesus. But in this class, and for Christians, the only source of information about Jesus and His life and ministry and teachings, the only authentic source, authoritative source for information about Jesus is the Bible itself. So, this lesson should really be entitled, What Does the Bible Say About Jesus? Uh, that should sound so simple. That should sound so basic. You know, you, like, yeah, of course. And yet, many people who claim to be Christians come up with these wild-eyed ideas and theories, you know, uh, and you, you ask them, where did you get that? You know, Surely you didn't get it from the Bible, and that's always the problem. They, 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 they got it from the internet, but not the Bible. So this is the best way to discover who Jesus is because only the Bible contains eyewitness accounts of His life recorded and preserved for us to read even to this day. Now in our last session I explained how the Bible was written, you know, the Bible itself, how it was organized and why Christians believe that it comes from God, or in other words, why Christians believe that the Bible is inspired. But I didn't tell you what the theme of the Bible was, or what was the Bible about? Well, the entire Bible is about Jesus. He's the main point of all the books of the Bible. The different parts explain different things about Him and His interaction with us. For example, the Old Testament is really the story about the creation of the world and then how God prepared for His coming, Jesus' coming, by forming um, the Jewish nation. All the events come together to form a human and historical stage for His eventual appearance as a man in this world. I've mentioned that before. The Old Testament basically tells this story through the eyes and through the words of the Jewish prophets and leaders and kings. A lot of times we get kind of caught up in the minutia of the Old Testament, the laws, the customs, you know, the stories, you know, and we forget, what is this all about? It's simply the story of how God created a unique people with a culture whose only purpose was to deliver Jesus onto the human uh, historical stage, period. And once they did that, they have fulfilled this is why it's such a tragedy that they rejected Christ. They, they were prepared for thousands of years to bring Him on stage, and when He finally arrived, they rejected Him. Uh, number two, the four Gospels are the eyewitness accounts of His life, His ministry, His death, resurrection, and ascension back to heaven. Again, the story recorded and preserved by men who were with Him for years and who knew Him intimately. The rest of the New Testament, written by other apostles and disciples of the apostles, show how His followers established the Christian church 
according to his instructions. Now in addition to this, there are teachings to help followers and disciples live their Christian lives in every generation and environment. So we could go anywhere in the Bible to find out about Jesus concerning the promise of His coming, concerning the preparation for His appearance, concerning the circumstances of His miraculous birth, the content of His teachings, the details of His death and resurrection, the people who knew Him personally and spread His teaching throughout the world. This is what this book is about. It's always about Jesus. But I don't think we, you know, we'd have time in a single lesson to do it. I don't just think it, I know it. We don't have time in a single lesson uh, to do this. However, what we can do is to focus on what the Bible says about who Jesus is. This is actually the most important question about Jesus Christ and we'll see what three individuals contained in the Bible, what do they say about Jesus, who He is. Right? So who is Jesus? Now remember, we're asking the question, who is Jesus according to the Bible? Not just what we think or what we feel or what we learn from another book or a movie or a teacher. Since most of the direct and eyewitness accounts about Him are in the New Testament portion of the Bible, we should go there to learn about Him. So thousands of people saw and heard Jesus speak and teach, even do miracles. There's absolutely no doubt of His existence because historians of that era write about Him and His ministry. Some people think, oh yeah, well, just guys in the Bible that wrote about Jesus. No, 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 no. He, he, he appears in secular history books, all right? Um, Josephus Flavius uh, was a Jewish historian who wrote about this particular period of time, you know, the early first century. Uh, he was not a follower of Jesus, but he mentions Jesus and the Christian religion in general in his history books. So here you have somebody who doesn't believe that Jesus is uh, the Son of God, he's not a follower of Jesus, he's just a historian and he's documenting the history of that period. Now he doesn't only write about Jesus, he writes about what was going on with the Jewish nation, the politics, the military you know, conflicts that were uh, happening at the time, and he mentions Jesus in his history because Jesus played a big part at a certain point in Jewish history. So history, not the Bible, but history, writes that Jesus was a Jewish man born into a humble family who lived in Israel approximately 2,000 years ago. History now, history, tells us that he began his ministry by claiming that he was the Jewish Messiah, the Savior, and he was eventually arrested and executed by the Roman government at the insistence of the Jewish leaders who accused him of causing civil unrest by his teachings. That's not just the Bible, that's history. We can find out what happened by reading history books. Eventually, according to history, his followers established the Christian church based on his teachings. So all of this that I've just mentioned, this is what history books teach about the facts of Jesus' life. So anybody who ever says to you, oh no, well, that's just a fantasy, that's just in the Bible. No, 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 no. You know, we have plenty of historical documents that mention the existence of Jesus. There were others, however, at the time, who actually followed Jesus as his special disciples, and they too recorded their accounts of his life. And we have these today. And so it is from these writers whose records form the New Testament that we can establish a much more comprehensive picture of who Jesus really was. For the sake of our study, we're going to examine three of these men's writings and descriptions of Jesus. All right. So the first witness, the first witness is Peter, of course. Peter the Apostle. Peter was a fisherman by trade and along with his brother Andrew had a family business. He was the first apostle called by Jesus to follow him on a full-time basis. He was to hear all of Jesus' teachings, witness his miracles, and later on be a leader in the establishing of the church and finally die as a martyr in Rome, claiming to the very end 
that what he had heard and saw was true. Remember, these guys who were martyred, they could have saved their own lives simply by saying, okay, I was just kidding. <laughs> Is it too late to apologize? I, I don't really believe that stuff. I'm just saying it, you know, for, to get popular or to make money, but they didn't. They went to their deaths. During Jesus' ministry, Jesus asked the apostles, including Peter, based on what they saw him say and do, who did they think he was? And we know the answer. Peter answered without hesitation. He said, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. So even while Jesus was alive, the Bible says that Peter believed and declared him to be the divine son of God. Later on, after Jesus was executed, Peter describes the things that he saw with his own eyes as he rebukes the Jews for their hard hearts and disbelief. Pentecost Sunday. This is Peter preaching to the crowd. This is after Jesus has ascended to heaven. The apostles have received the Holy Spirit. Peter gets up to preach and he says to the crowd, but you disown the holy and righteous one and ask for a murderer to be granted to you. You know, when they exchange Jesus for Barabbas, that's what he's talking about here. You, you exchange the, the holy and living one for a murderer, he says, to be granted to you but put to death the prince of life, the one whom God raised from the dead, a fact to which we are witnesses. I think another, no, no, verse 15. A fact to which we are witnesses, we meaning he and the other apostles. Now, there's a lot written about Peter in the New Testament and Peter himself writes two of the epistles contained in this part of the Bible. But just these two passages just read summarize well what Peter thought about Jesus based on what he experienced, okay? So Peter claimed that Jesus was the Christ and the Messiah, the Savior promised by the Old Testament. In other words, Jesus was the one sent by God to save mankind. That's what Peter said. Peter also concluded that Jesus was divine based on what he heard Jesus say and saw him do. So you see a man raise another person from the dead is only one conclusion you're going to come to. Okay, this is not just some ordinary person here. This person has divine power, is divine. And then finally, Peter saw Jesus executed by the Roman soldiers and then saw him after God raised him from the dead. So as I said before, Peter never changed or denied his witness, even when he was threatened, imprisoned, and finally sent to his death for saying these things. So when we want to know who is Jesus, the Bible through Peter's words says that he's the Son of God, he's the Savior, and he was resurrected from the dead. That's what Peter says. That's his witness if he was here today. Let's ask somebody else who was there at the time. Let's ask Thomas. Thomas, another apostle, we don't know as much about Thomas as we know about Peter, of course, but he's the one often referred to as doubting Thomas, right? Doubting Thomas because he wanted proof of Jesus' resurrection before he would believe. What he says about Jesus is interesting because of this very fact. He demands proof before he would continue to believe. I mean, he believed, he was the one that said, you know, when Jesus was alive you know, and he was planning to go uh, into the area of Judea where it was dangerous for Jesus to go because they were looking for him and everything. And, and what is, isn't it Thomas who said, hey, let's all go with him. Let's go die with him if we have to. So he was pretty zealous. He, he was not afraid. I have a feeling, and this is only an opinion, he was crushed with disappointment when Jesus was executed. I mean, he really thought this, this was the real deal right here. He was the Messiah. He was ready to die with him you know, uh, when, when Jesus was ministering. And so when Jesus was executed, he was crushed. And so when the others came to him and said, we've seen the Messiah, we've seen the Lord, he's risen. You know, he said, oh, no, 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 no. I mean, you know, I've been burned once, that's enough. You know, unless I see the holes, unless I see it with my own eyes, unless I can put my hands you know, in the holes and in the side myself, I, I'm not going to believe. And somehow I don't hold it against Thomas because that's a very human reaction that he had. I don't want to be hurt again. I don't want to be like up you know, and then phew, be disappointed. Uh, I'm in mourning, I'm grieving. You know. And so what 
he says about Jesus is, is fascinating because of his disbelief at some point. He knew Jesus and like the other apostles, he had lived and worked with Jesus for three years. He saw the miracles, he heard the teachings, he witnessed Jesus die on the cross. He was convinced Jesus was dead, so brutal and final was his execution at the hands of the Roman soldiers. And as I said, when the other apostles reported that they had seen Jesus resurrected and alive again, Thomas was not on board. Now in the Gospel of John, we read about Jesus' confrontation with Thomas and how Thomas is encouraged to believe. So in John chapter 20, verse 24, all the way to 28, it says, but Thomas, one of the 12 called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples were saying to him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see his hands, the imprint of the nails, and put my finger into the place of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. After eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors having been shut, and stood in their midst and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, reach here with your finger and see my hands, and reach here with your hand and put it into my side, and do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. Note what this exchange teaches us about Jesus. Thomas believes that Jesus is actually risen from the dead. He believes it now. Thomas acknowledges that Jesus is God, not just a prophet or a teacher or a holy man. He is God, my Lord and my God. The apostle also demonstrates that Jesus is worthy of not only belief, but worship but worship as well. And Thomas, in calling Jesus Lord, indicates that Jesus has authority over him. Once again, a short passage, but one where the Bible sets forth important facts about who Jesus is, the divine object of belief and worship, and the Lord over us. You know, people, people are free to choose whether they believe this or not. You know, I, I share this with people, you know, people write you know, uh, on the website and they say, you know, they say sometimes nasty things <laughs> that we're crazy and this is all a, just a lot of you know, hooey. And my response to them is, hey, you can choose to believe if you want or not. That's your choice, buddy. But you can't deny that that's what this teaches. The Bible teaches that Jesus is the Son of God, that Jesus is divine, that Jesus resurrected from the dead. The, the Bible teaches all of that. You don't have to believe it if you don't want to, but you can't tell me that that's not what the Bible teaches. See? All right, a third person, moving along. And the third person would be the Apostle Paul, of course. Perhaps no one other than Jesus himself articulates in more detail the character and the person of Jesus Christ than Paul the Apostle. As we know, Paul was a Jew <clears throat> and an early persecutor of the Christian church. He was a Pharisee. Pharisees were, Pharisees were lawyers, okay? They were lawyers, they knew the law, and they interpreted the law for the, for the people. Uh, Pharisees was a kind of lawyer. He belonged to the Pharisee party, if you wish. The term Pharisee means the separate ones, the separated ones. There was a time when Pharisees were the heroes of the people uh, uh, during the intertestamentary period there. There was a time when Greek was over the Greek culture and the Greek language. Greek ways were starting to overwhelm the Jews to the point where they were not even knowing the Hebrew language anymore and they were drifting away from this, the Holy Scriptures and into Greek mythology and into Greek philosophy. And among the Jewish people there rose up this group to protect the word, to protect God's word, to protect the scriptures, to you know, back to the Bible, you know, back to basics. They were the separated ones, the Pharisees. They were heroes at that time. But after a while, after a century or two, these people drifted into legalism and all kinds of uh, you know, uh, showy religion and so on and so forth. So they kept the name, they kept the rep, but they no longer 
were really the separated ones. So Paul was one of these guys. He was a, he was a, um, uh, a Pharisee. Uh, and the Pharisees themselves were part of the ruling class of the Jewish society of, Jew of Jesus' day. Uh, he was a religious zealot for Judaism who had obtained a mandate from the ruling council of Jewish leaders to wage a campaign of persecution against Christians in order to discourage their growth. In other words, he got the leaders of the nation to give him permission by law to hunt down Christians and put them in jail and destroy this religion. In recounting his own experience, Paul describes the meeting with Jesus Christ that changed his life. In Acts 22, we read, brethren, this is Paul now speaking. He says, brethren and fathers, hear my defense, which I now offer you. And when they heard that he was addressing them in the Hebrew dialect, they became even more quiet. And he said, I am a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city, educated under Gamaliel, strictly according to the law of our fathers, being zealous for God, just as you are all today. I persecuted this way to the death. That's how Christianity was referred to at the beginning. It was called the way. I persecuted this way to the death, binding and putting both men and women into prisons, as also the high priest and all the council of the elders can testify. From them I also received letters to the brethren and started off for Damascus in order to bring even those who were there to Jerusalem as prisoners to be punished. But it happened that as I was on my way, approaching Damascus about noontime, a very bright light suddenly flashed from heaven all around me, and I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I answered, who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus, the Nazarene, whom you are persecuting. And those who were with me saw the light, to be sure, but did not understand the voice of the one who was speaking to me. And I said, what shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, get up and go on into Damascus, and there you will be told of all that has been appointed for you to do. But since I could not see because of the brightness of that light, I was led by the hand by those who were with me and came into Damascus. A certain Ananias, a man who was devout by the standard of the law and well spoken of by all the Jews who lived there, came to me and standing near said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very time I looked up at him and he said, the God of our fathers has appointed you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear an utterance from his mouth. For you will be a witness for him to all men of what you have seen and heard. Now, why do you delay? Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. And so thus began the conversion and mission of one of the most prolific of Jesus' apostles. Now, we know uh, both from history um, and the Bible that Paul went on to preach and establish the Christian religion throughout the Roman provinces and empire. He was eventually imprisoned by the emperor Nero and executed in Rome in 67 AD on account of his role as a Christian leader. And so Paul, the adversary of the church, the one who initially denied who Jesus was, ended up giving his life for his faith in Christ. In his writings, we have a very dynamic description of Jesus and his exalted position. He's a good witness, because he started off not believing in Jesus. <laughs> he started off wanting to destroy Christianity. So he's got something important to say about Christianity and about Jesus. So let's just look at what he says. I won't paraphrase it, we'll just read what he says. He talks, he's speaking about Jesus now in a letter to the Colossian church and he says, he, meaning Jesus, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. So note what Paul specifically says about who Jesus is. First of all, he says he's the visible image of God. When you see Jesus, you're looking at God. 
When you see Jesus, you're looking at God. He says He existed before creation. That means that He existed before time. What's the significance of that? Well, who else existed before time? Yeah, God. <laughs> it's just another way of saying He's God. He says He's supreme over creation. Well, what does that mean? Well, He says it in Mark 16, doesn't He? All authority has been given unto me. That's what Mark says about him. Here, Paul says the same thing. He has authority over all things. He's also the agent of creation. Everything in the material and spiritual world was created by him and for him. He's eternal, another quality of the living God. Paul says he's the head of the church. And here's a point I want to make. Jesus is the only leader of the church in heaven and on earth. He does not share this with any other person. There are no co-leaders of the church. In the local congregation, we have you know, leaders in the local congregation, of course, the elders, shepherds, pastors, whatever you wish to call them, okay. But in the entire body of Christ, that includes all of the congregations of the church in the world, you know, the body of Christ, there's only one head of that, and that's Jesus. Whether he's in heaven or on earth, it's always Jesus. It's not a man, it's not a woman, it's not a person, okay. Uh, also, he leads those who will resurrect. It's another way of saying that he's eternal by saying that he leads in the future. In other words, Paul is saying he's the one who will resurrect you in the future. Well, he's already in the future. How's that? Well, because he exists outside of time. We live in time. Yesterday, today, tomorrow, you know, we live in time. He lives outside of time. That's why Paul talks about him as being there before the creation was made. And he's there after the creation is finished and we're resurrected from the dead. He's both at the beginning and at the end at the same time. Well, who, who can do that? Well, only God can do that. So he's, he's, he's saying that Jesus is God you know, five, six, seven different ways. So these things, of course, are not the only things that Paul says about Jesus. But we can see from these that Paul was proclaiming Jesus as the divine Son of God based on his own experiences and knowledge of Christ and his teachings. So we've reviewed three of the eyewitnesses who describe and explain in the Bible who they believe Jesus to be. And I repeat again, people don't have to believe that. They don't have to believe that. But they cannot say that that's not what the Bible teaches. All right? And, and, and if you're teaching someone else and sharing with someone else, there's no reason for them to be angry with you. There's no reason for them to call you names, you know, or you're narrow-minded. All you're saying is, I'm just showing you what the Bible teaches about Jesus. That's it. You, you can accept it or reject it. I'm just wanting to show you. Um, so this leaves us with one last person to examine, and that is, of course, Jesus himself. Our description of Jesus would be incomplete if we didn't examine at least a few things that the Lord said about His true identity. Here are three things, very briefly, that He said about Himself to three different people. Okay? Number one, the Samaritan woman in John 4, 25 and 6. In a conversation with a woman while traveling, Jesus answers her question about who is the true Messiah. Uh, 4, 25 and 6, <clears throat> it says, The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When that one comes, he will declare all things to us. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. <laughs> that is an amazing passage of scripture because Jesus doesn't say that to anybody. <laughs> but he says it to a Samaritan woman, flat out, there's no, the son of man, you know, sometimes Jesus would say the son of man, that was a coded way of referring to himself, you know what I'm saying? But right here, I mean, it's, it's, it's all out there. Yeah, the Messiah is coming, that's right, that's me. The one who's speaking to you, I'm the Messiah. That's just an amazing thing that Jesus is saying here. So Jesus describes himself as the savior spoken of by the Jews. One argument is that, well, you know, Jesus was a well-meaning, but he was deluded. He was crazy. You know. Well, crazy people don't raise people from the dead, but you know. 
And here, this is not a crazy person. He's just flat out saying who he is. The second person that Jesus talks to is Peter the Apostle. You know, we've looked at Peter's declaration earlier in this lesson, but this time let's focus on Jesus' response to what Peter said, okay? In Matthew 16, he said to them, but here's Jesus talking to his apostles and he's asking them, who do people think that I am? You know, what do people say about me? And so he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barhona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. So note that Jesus confirms what Peter says about him, that it's true, and even goes on to reveal how Peter has come to this knowledge. The Lord has shown this to you. The Father has revealed this to you. All right, the third group are the apostles themselves. After Jesus' resurrection and appearance to over 500 disciples, Jesus gives his apostles and future disciples their mission. Verse uh, chapter 28, Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Matthew 28, 18 to 20. Note here in this passage, Jesus claims exclusive divine authority over everything, over everything. Now, these are only a few of the things that are recorded concerning Jesus, but from these we see some of the things that the Bible teaches about Jesus. Now, I'll just put them in a list, okay? These are some of the things that the Bible teaches about Jesus, that he is a true historical figure. He wasn't a ghost or a fairy tale. He was a real person. He was the Jewish Messiah. In other words, the Bible teaches that Jesus was the Jewish Messiah. The Bible teaches that he was the divine Son of God. The Bible teaches that he is God himself. The Bible teaches that in human form he resurrected from the dead. The Bible teaches he's an eternal being. The Bible teaches the agent of creation. The Bible teaches he's the head of the church. He's the supreme authority over heaven and earth. And we could keep going. I only have 35 minutes. I could keep going, but the Bible teaches this, these things about Jesus, clearly. And there's no ambiguity, it's clear. Uh, so we could go on for more, but I'm going to close this lesson with a quote from the Gospel of John, who faced the similar dilemma, and that is trying to list all the things he, he actually heard and saw Jesus do. Faced with the mountain of information before him, Jesus writes in the 20th and 21st chapters of his Gospel record the following. In chapter 20, he says, therefore many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, meaning in his gospel, but these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. In other words, I haven't, I haven't put down everything that I've saw and heard. I just put down enough for you to believe. That tells me there's enough information in here to create belief in me. The person who says, well, I'm not sure, I don't have quite enough information. Uh-uh, no. Uh, God who created me and you knows how much we need, how much information we need to make a decision. And he's saying, we've got plenty of information to make up our minds. And then the same gospel, John 20, a little further in verse 21, chapter 21, he says, and there are also many other things which Jesus did, which if they were written in detail, I suppose that even the world itself would not contain the books that would be written. So just the very little that we have about Jesus fills libraries, I mean, you know, you ever, do you ever Google Jesus <laughs> online? I mean. It's never ending, there's so much, so much material. Okay, so there's who is Jesus actually answering the question, what does the Bible say about who Jesus is? Well, we've kind of listed a lot of things that the Bible says. All right, next time we're going to talk about what does the Bible say about salvation? We keep going through our lesson. So thank you 
for your attention. I appreciate it.